Welcome to Codex History of Video Games. I'm Mike Coletta. And I'm Tyler Osby. It's so much harder to say it and dance at the same time, but we're doing yeah. it. So today, I'm excited. I'm excited. We're continuing That's our right. Persona it, series. Yeah. And if you're not watching us on YouTube or whatever, you should be because you could have seen us dancing. If you're just listening in your car to the MP3, you don't get to see us dancing. That's all. But you could just pretend that we're really good dancers, though. Yeah. Just picture the Numa Numa guy. It's us. It's us. We're, we're, we're Numa that. Numaing. That's all we do. Well, I'm yeah. I'm excited to get into Persona 2 today, right? Persona 2. Persona 2, yes. Uh, I, I'm excited to talk about this because, as you all know, I love Persona. I haven't played through all of the games completely, but I've spent uh, I spent time with all of them. Um, and I've, I've played through the later games a lot. Um, but spending time with the earlier games, uh, especially in PSP remake form, has been a lot of fun because I think they hold up pretty well in the PSP remakes. Um, I, and uh, honestly, it's it's a little surprising to me how well they hold up because sometimes you go back and play these old RPGs and especially like old like, JRPGs like from the Super Nintendo era. And there are a lot of them that hold up, but there are a lot that don't really hold up. Right. Um, they just they're just products of their time. They were fun back in the day, but like you should just play something else today. Right. Yeah. Um, so the Persona games, though, I think hold up really well. Um, and I think the PSP versions especially have a whole new coat of paint on them. They're they're great, but they're also the same game. Like they they make them look better, but it is the same game. So if you you know if you want to play a lot of uh, the, like the original Persona on on PlayStation, you can play that. Um, but it's it, the PSP remake is really the way to go. The translation's better. It's just it's just better. Um, so last time we talked about Persona, I talked about Shin Megami Tensei as a whole, and because that is a large series, it spans many sub series like there's a lot of spin-offs i i hesitate to call them spin-offs at this point because they've become series unto themselves and it's like they're just it's just there's just a big old tree of like lots of megami tensei stuff um so uh it's it's there's just a lot of them so uh we, we talked a lot about the first persona game last time uh which like i said holds up pretty well um i think it plays well in an emulator of course assuming you have a legal copy of the game of course you bought a legal copy always of right this game plays well in PPSSPP, assuming you ripped your own copy from your PlayStation Portable that you own yourself, then you can play it on your computer. We wouldn't um, have any of the way here. I'm pretty sure that's legal. Maybe there's some things about circumventing copy. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I can't tell you to do a thing or don't do a thing. Everything is at your own risk, but it does. It, it's, it's, it's all right. Um, so I want to catch folks up to where we are here. Uh, before we talk about the game itself, we'll talk a little bit about what we talked about previously. So previously on codex uh, but did you did you see the trailer for x-men 97 yes i didn't see the trailer for it i missed i didn't watch the trailer yet yeah so uh this is a tangent and i have a button for that now it's, the tangent button. here we go here we go here we go uh uh, uh hold on hold on <laughs> oh that's oh, really good that's yeah. really good that was not me that was uh that was mo in the thank in, you mo that, uh on discord so we have that one <laughs> uh tangent uh x-men 97 is getting its own like a uh, sequel series i think it's on netflix is that i thought it was disney plus oh maybe just oh disney plus makes sense because it's marvel um mm. but it seems to be like a direct uh a direct continuation of the original like they're just picking up where they left off yeah. are they putting all the original on there so you could catch up i hope so i would hope so i think the only reason they wouldn't do that is some sort of weird rights Thing because thing. especially i know marvel doesn't quite have all the rights to x-men stuff there's weird like sony things going on that's why we got movies like madam webb which i'm down to talk about with anybody um i know tony the spidey librarian was talking about it this week and uh uh anyway anyway that's a tangent did you watch it yeah i did i saw madam webb yeah was it good i haven't watched it no it was bad yeah if you just need like a thumbs up thumbs down it's a thumbs down oh no and i'm happy to talk about it uh maybe not here where we're, where we're talking yeah yeah this isn't a spider-man yeah. podcast this is this is a we can do tangents but we can't let the tangent take over the persona let's get to the persona that's right that's right but i did want to talk about x-men 97 real quick just that is for cool. you because i i was hoping you saw the, the thing okay back to persona um so one of the things about the persona series is that like other jrpg series not all the games are like connected story-wise right um in the case of games like final fantasy they're not even in the same universe. Like Final Fantasy VI and VII have nothing to do with each other. There are some themes between them, maybe some items, some enemies that are similar. But like Chocobos. Chocobos are in most of the Final Fantasy games. Um, there are things that carry over between them, but mostly unconnected 
story wise. Um, uh, so Persona 3, 4, and 5 are all disconnected stories that take place in the same universe. So they're a little bit more connected than than Final Fantasy games, but you don't need to have played Persona 3 to understand what's going on in Persona 4. There's just, there's nothing there for you. There's a couple of like small references that you'll be like Leo with the beer can and you'll be like, hey, that's, yeah, they said hey, the thing. you did it, yeah. But, but that's it. Like you don't, it's, you're not going to have a bad time if you didn't play the other ones. And that's, that's true of 3, 4, and 5. I kind of uh, love that. Yeah. It's great. It makes it less intimidating to jump in. Yeah. Um, the reason I bring that up is because while three, four, and five are not connected to each other in story, that's actually a change to the series that is as recent as the social link system, which is something that uh, is sort of uh, part and parcel to that series. Now, you wouldn't make a Persona game without the social link system, but the first two games do not have the social link system. Um, so, but, but what I mean by this, to bring it all back, is that the first few Persona games are directly connected in story. Um, so like Persona 1 sort of continues into Persona 2, uh, and there are some different protagonists and, but like some characters are the same, like they're definitely sort of continuing on the same storyline. They're not super connected in the same sense that like, you know, Last of Us Part 2 is a direct continuation of Part 1. Um, it's more like, uh, I can't think of a good example, but, but they're, they're, if you played Persona 1, you'll get more out of Persona 2. Um, so which makes... <laughs> what Atlas did to this series in the nineties for gamers, uh, which is the, it, what they did to this series was a travesty. I'm just going to say it Ooh. because we talked about it last Let's time. Get the dirt. I'm ready. Yeah. We talked about it last time. The first persona game, when it came to, to North America, it was heavily altered uh, in the name of like localization. I guess they basically, this is a game that takes place in Japan. They made it take place, not in Japan. They changed a bunch of stuff. Uh, they continued to sort of make some mistakes here the same way with, with Persona 2. Um, so uh, they changed it. Like I said, the first one, they changed the setting of the game. They changed characters' names. They even changed the race of one of the characters. They did not want this game to feel Japanese. This was a different time, the 90s, right? Not all games mm -hmm. made in Japan were getting North America releases because they thought that North America gamers were dumb and didn't like Japanese stuff. And, and they bad were, at video games. And bad at video games, and they were wrong about at least one of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, you know if if the game had taken place in Japan, I think people would still have liked it. That's yeah. All. So we talked about the story of Persona last week a bit. I don't want to spoil things too much because I think the story is like a big part of why people play these games. So um, I don't want to like really really get into it, but it is a little bit hard to talk about Persona Two without doing that. So I guess if you think us talking about the the story of the games here is too much and you want to play them for yourself, then this is your warning. Turn back now set a reminder on your phone or whatever to listen to this when you finish playing persona one and persona two um if you want to play them yourself um, yeah get but, out I, yeah. i'd say just get out right now this is me angry with you that you're going to try to listen to this when you want we play might spoil game, so we might spoil that's right um so if you don't plan to play those games soon uh, and you have no idea how weird persona is i bet you'll forget all of that when you go when you do go to play the game, because I've replayed Persona games and I've been like, I don't remember any of this. I'm replaying <laughs> Persona 3 now in Persona 3 Reload, and I'm like, I don't remember any of this. <laughs> That's kind uh, of fun though, because it's you're great. Like experiencing it again, again. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, it's like a brand new game for me, uh, exactly. and I know they've changed a lot of stuff in Persona 3 Reload. So like the stuff I used to know is like maybe not as accurate, but still, I kind of thought I had the gist of the game, and I I didn't. I I don't know what's going on. Um. So let's talk about the first sequel to a great game that was botched in translation. Uh, surely, Mike, they learned their they learn their lesson, right? By the time Persona 2 comes out to the West, it's been four years, right? You can learn so much in four years. That's I bet right. You, they learn their lesson. Everything's fine. Game of the year contender, Persona yeah. 2. So these are role-playing games, Mike. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. wanna, I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of a Persona fan in the 90s, in, in North America specifically, which means they've only played the first game. Okay. I'm and wearing... Converse sneakers. Yes, that is. Okay. Uh, I would say Car relevant to the '90s, but actually relevant to now too. Like Converse are just timeless. Cargo shorts. Yes. Oh. Cargo shorts, giant pockets. Giant pockets and a shirt that is from the guts, Nickelodeon's guts. That's what I'm wearing. I'm oh, role playing. Man, I'm okay, really, I'm really getting shirt. into it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Global. The guts. Agro Crag. Yes. Oh, first it was the Agro Crag, then it was the Mega Crag, and oh. now it's the Super Agro Crag. Wait, it's back. It's back. The super oh, aggro crack. Okay. Again, we can't go on another tangent. We can't hit the button again. But that's what I'm. <laughs> we just did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I I'm in my I'm in the shoes of a gamer. 
about am I about to buy this game? Is that what I'm doing? Or did you, I just bought it? You you're you're you just bought this. Well, you're about my, to buy this game. My, my okay. mom just bought so it. this is heavily based on my own experience, though not like a hundred percent, because I didn't play Persona back in the day. Like this mm -hmm. is just what I would have assumed how how this would have affected me as a child. So Okay, okay. Okay. So after visiting grandma and grandpa with your mom, mm -hmm. you're at a crowded Kmart in the year two thousand. It's late two thousand. So the PlayStation 2 is already out, right? But you don't have one yet, mostly because they're $299 and you literally can't find them. Do you remember when the PlayStation 2 came out and how you just couldn't find them for like oh, yeah. two years? Well, they were supercomputers. How could you find one? <laughs> yeah, that's true. They they were uh, they were getting caught in customs because they're they were so powerful. Yeah. So you don't have a PlayStation 2 yet. They were You just couldn't find them. There's a massive shortage of them. And ordering things online was like not quite as convenient or trustworthy back in the day. There was no way your mom was going to put her credit card into a computer to buy you something in 2000. It was expensive and you already have a perfectly good PlayStation at home. Dude, were, what, do you remember your first ever internet purchase? Uh, I don't know if I remember my first ever. I can tell you the first one I made on my phone, which I thought was ab oh. absurd at the time to be able to buy something on your phone. Yeah, mine was a DVD set for that 70s show I bought on Amazon. That was my nice. first ever thing I bought online. And I thought it was weird. And then it happened once. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> this is so great. And then yeah. you got it. It showed up at your house and you were like, what? I was a sophomore yeah. in college. It was nuts. It was, it was a trying time. It was crazy. Dang. And, and and things took a long time back then, too. Like nowadays, Prime shipping, if you don't get something in two days from Prime, if it's not in two days, you're like, this is this is crazy. This is taking oh, way yeah. too long from other places. If it takes like more than a week, you're like, this is crazy. But back in those days, you order something online. It was like four to six weeks. And you're just like, OK, and not really any tracking. Right. You were just sort yeah. of like, I hit the button and I'm just like, I guess in a month, if it's not here, I don't know. You're I don't even know. What I do. it. Yeah. Yeah. You really know it you're yoloing it but anyway anyway yeah yeah you can't order so, stuff online it's too hard at this time in 2000. that's right your mom wasn't she didn't trust the internet she does now she orders a lot of stuff online but mm -hmm. back then she didn't trust the internet wasn't putting her credit card in and like i said you've already got a perfectly good playstation at home what's wrong with the one you have right yeah yeah so anyway you want a new game you're at kmart you want a new game you like the first persona game it was a little weird but you had it you liked it you got it on discount or something and you see a game on on the, on the shelf at Kmart. It's called Persona 2 Eternal Punishment. Okay. It's okay. brand new. It's for your original PlayStation, and it continues the story of one of your favorite games, Persona. This is a sequel, right? It's rated T yeah. for Teen, but if you can somehow make the purchase yourself while you're in the electronic section and mom's shopping for overalls for your little brother, you can make this happen, right? You reach in, you grab that 50 bucks that grandpa stealthily slipped to you while shaking your hand. Grandpa was a master at this, by the way. You shake his hand, he's got cash in it for you. Dude, he was every, everyone loves a cash a, a cash loose grandpa that's just throwing cash out when you're that's right sh shaking his hand yep grandpa paul master at that r.i.p to a real one to a real one yep um so you ask the guy behind the counter to get persona 2 out of the glass case open the plastic case it's in and he hands you like the hard plastic case you remember the like Ooh, the, anti the jewel thing? yeah the jewel case yeah uh so he hands you this fresh case still in the plastic mission accomplished you tell mom you got it. You're careful not to show her the cover and the teen rating because she's going to make you take it back if she sees that teen rating, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you're in the car. You unwrap the shrink wrap. You do what every kid in the 90s ever did. And you open up that jewel case. What's the first thing you do? You read the manual. No, no, no. The first thing you do. Oh. You take you... a big whiff of that new game smell. Oh, how can I forget that? I still do that. <sighs> new game smell. That's what, what I, I miss about buying physical games dude when i bought the new the stardew valley on switch the physical edition and i opened the case up it had the smell i didn't smell mm -hmm. the cartridge because we all know the cartridges well they taste bad yeah switch games cartridges taste bad yeah that's why they we downloaded them but it had that smell that new electronic smell i'm all about it you yeah. know i'm all about it yep then you get in the car next thing you do you open the manual like you said yeah, you got to yeah. read the manual on the way home yep <clears throat> so you're op you've opened the manual. You're re getting ready to read like the story set up for the game. Hold that moment in your head, Mike, because we're going to come back to that later. We're not there yet. Okay. First, I want to move on to talking about Persona 2 Innocent Sin. Let's talk about the grime facts. The grime facts. for Okay, I'm ready. I'm Number ready. one, developer is Atlas. Atlas. Uh, they published it too. Um, it released also made on... Snowboard Kids. That's Important. true. And Jack Frost is in the Persona series. Important. Yeah. Um, 
It released on June 24th, 1999 in Japan and September 20th, 2011 in North America. Um, the best way to play this game, there it came out on a bunch of systems. It came out on the PlayStation and it came out on the PSP. So just two state, just two systems, not a bunch. Um, but the best way to play this game is the PSP remake. Hands down. There's no like, don't go back and play the PlayStation version. Just play the PSP remake. You got um, it. It sold 390,680 copies, which is, you know, not a ton, but not terrible either. It's a JRPG through and through. Doesn't get more JRPG than the Persona series, if you ask me. That's the genre. Average time to complete, 35 and a half hours, which is pretty short for a Persona game, uh, but comparable to the first one. They get longer as the series goes on. And this was pretty typical of JRPGs, right? That's a that's a very reasonable length for yeah. me. Like, yeah. that's 35 hours. That's great. That's, That's good. That's what I want. For a JRPG, like the 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 range I'm looking in is like 50, right? 50 to 60. More than that, it's going to kind of drag. And and the Persona series, like it's longer than that. Most of those games are longer and they, they kind of drag a little bit. But you get to be friends with so many high school That's kids. True. Yeah, they take a long time. They're worth it, but they are long. Um, but so for me, it's like the 50 hour mark is like, that's what I'm looking for in a JRPG. But th less is OK, too. I would rather less than more, to be honest. That's right. Um, let's talk about the Metacritic score. 75. Ooh, that's solid. That's, that's a good, that's yeah. great. Nothing wrong with that. If you like the genre in the series, you're going to like this game. If you don't like those things, this game's probably not going to change your mind. That's okay. Right? There's a game made for the people who love this kind of game, and there's nothing wrong with that. 75. If I see a 75 and I know it's a thing I enjoy, I'm still going to get it. Yep. It's not yep. going to stop me. You see a 75 Persona game for me? I'm like, yeah. If I see a Final Fantasy game that's a 75, I'm like, that's for me. That's 75 it. Metal Gear Solid game. Yep. That's for me. Mm -hmm. So gameplay wise, Persona 2, uh, this game is very similar to the first one. You play a student in a high school. You crawl dungeons in an alternate reality. Uh, the dungeon crawling in this game is not first person like it is in the first game, which is kind of refreshing if you that's ask me. That's nice. That's I, good. I don't really like first person dungeon crawlers. Uh, I think maybe uh, that's like probably my least my least favorite part of the first game. Back in the 90s, maybe, when 3D was like this new cool thing um, and doing anything in first person was awesome. And I know some of the older Megami Tensei games and lots of RPGs in those days like had sort of a first person perspective that you would like go down hallways and and fight monsters and stuff. And like that was probably cool for the time. I think it, that part especially doesn't hold up very well today. So I'm glad that they, they stepped away from that for Persona 2. Um, so... I, I, I actually kind of like watching everything from an outside angle. I don't like to pretend to be the main character in a JRPG. I think the main character is just another character, and that's the one that you control, but I'm not really looking for like a, hey, I want to insert myself into this game, right? Yeah, you're treating it like it's a story you're being told, which yeah. is nice, and sometimes which, that works great. Yeah, which is different from like Western RPGs. Generally, Western RPGs are very heavy on the, the, the customization, creating a character, pretending you are that character, like like everything is first person in a lot of those games like that's the point jrpg's a little bit more of, of a of a viewer of the story and the main character is just the one you control uh, off topic i'm reading this book right now for the podcast uh it's kind of hard to see it's called significant zero by walt mm -hmm. williams the guy who did spec ops line one of the guys who helped with spec ops line. oh there's a big chunk about this very topic about oh. like being the character versus watching the character you know that yeah. you're playing as and it's, it's pretty interesting so. Yeah, and there's definitely a big difference there, mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm cool with that for Persona 2. Um, so it's a welcome change to me. Uh, from a battle perspective, you're still fighting with swords and guns and personas. Um, we, we're not quite to social links yet. That comes around in Persona 3, uh, but this game does add a new system, and it's it's the rumor system. So one of the main themes of, of Persona in general is sort of the nature of reality, right? And each game kind of explores a different aspect of like the nature of reality. Persona 2's theme is is about how perception is reality, right? That is like, however your brain interprets whatever you see and hear, that's reality to you, whether it's objectively true or false, right? We can get real philosophical here about it. We've all taken, I don't know if you took a uh, philosophy 101 class in college. Oh, yeah. My, my professor wore a beret too. He was full in. It oh, we might have had the same, the same. Oh, we probably had the same guy. And we I'm probably stoked. did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're not going to get like super deep into that. We're not that kind of podcast. But the way that that theme, the rumors theme manifests from a gameplay perspective is in this rumors system. So if you talk to an NPC in the game and you hear a rumor from them, 
uh, you have the option to continue spreading that rumor. And that makes things happen. Your words turn into reality. You're like manifesting stuff. then. Exactly. Kinda. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's kind of neat. And it's like a good way to connect like sort of the, the real world stuff that happens at school to like the rest of the game. Right. Um, this is uh, connected to a wider theme in, in Japanese culture called Kododama, which is sort of the belief that people's words and thoughts affect the world around us. That's like kind of a, a thing that I, somebody who is like more well-versed in Japanese culture can probably give us a lecture on Matt, that. Matt, Matt in Japan maybe knows about Kododama, we're, we're but putting up the Matt signal. The, the Matt signal. How have yeah. we, have we, we've never made that joke before. We've never made that joke before. That's that really just, good. Mike. That was just fresh off the dome. Thank you so much. The That's Matt really signal good. is up. Putting up the Matt signal. Matt, if you know anything about Kodadama, please tell us more. Please tell us more. We're both dressed right now as uh, James Gordon. <laughs> we are putting <laughs> up the Matt signal. <laughs> so you can also talk to your enemies in this game, which is kind of a thing that early Megami Tensei games let you do. Um, depending on the monster's alignment and which of your party members you talk to them with and what they say, you can like get gifts from them. Um, you can convince them to join your party. That That's kind of how you get more personas is, is by doing that. Um, the personas or shadows in this game are very Lovecraftian, which is a thing I know you're you're a fan of, Mike. Ooh, so um, a lot of tentacles and octopus stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. A lot, Each of, a lot persona of tentacle game, faces. Yeah. Oh, oh, Each persona that. game kind of sort of picks like a mythos that it that it that it uh, focuses on. Although everything is kind of in every persona game, but like there's there's a lot of like some of them will do like very Shakespearean stuff. I want to say Persona Five is very Shakespearean. Uh, with like characters from Shakespeare plays will be personas that you can you can get you can catch them all. Um, so there's a lot of personas or monsters in this game. Uh, and like Pokemon, you got to catch them all, right? They come from a bunch of different mythos. In this one, and, and this might not be the only one you can do this in, but in this game, you can recruit actual Satan. So wow. that's this game's cool. very metal. Yeah, super, super metal. So the story here is uh, you play a character named Tatsuya Suo, who uh, is pretty cool at school. You're a Ooh, senior, I'm you get popular? good grades. You're popular. Yeah, because you get good grades. This is a, this is a thing that I've noticed in, in the Persona series is that if you answer questions correctly, um, your knowledge doesn't go up. Your charm goes up because people say, that guy, that guy's good at school. And that guy's got it. I yeah. love that. That's so it's so unlike real life, but I still love that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, uh, I don't know how things are in Japan, but that's true. in the US, you'd be a nerd if you answer a question correctly, maybe your knowledge goes up. Maybe even your courage goes up. <laughs> yeah, but you're still, you don't want to be a nerd. Your, your nerd score goes up, at least your if you went to high school in the early 2000s, like I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, you ride a motorcycle in this game, which is pretty cool. That's how cool you are. You ride a motorcycle. How old are you? I don't know, high school age, 17. You're a senior. So like, you're 17. Oh, 18. so you're like 17, 18. Okay. Yeah, that seems you're very senior. dangerous. I'm already acting like this character is concerned dad right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, as a kid, you're like, whoa, so cool. As an adult, you're like, that's really dangerous. Do you, you wear a helmet? helmet? <laughs> yeah, you wearing a helmet? <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, this game actually has two high schools in it. Um, your school, the school that your character goes to, is called Seven Sisters. Uh, and then there's a less cool school called uh, Kasugayame High. Uh, Kasuga Yama, hi. Um, so you and this other girl named Lisa, you go to band practice with this guy named Ikichi. This is like the first like five minutes of this game. Um, Ikichi goes to Kasuga Yama, hi, and he's kind of a bad kid, right? He's like, he's like kind of a, you know, somebody who your parents might describe as a bad influence. So you're saying he answers no questions correctly in class. That's right. Hmm. Also, his band practices in a prison. Wow, that's a choice. So, yeah, that should tell you something. Um, the kids get into some kind of argument about how the, he, this guy, Ikichi used to like pants people. And then somebody calls him a name based on that. I can't remember. It's pretty funny, but I don't remember the exact conversation that happens. Um, and then Philemon shows up or, or Philemon shows up. He's like a sort of a biblical character, but also a character in persona that is not related to his role in the Christian Bible. Um, but you know, that butterfly that like motif that you see in a lot of persona games. Oh That's yeah. Philemon. That Oh, okay. Yeah, so that that guy. Anyway, he shows up. Um, he tells the kids in some weird dream world that rumors are coming true and that they'll have to summon their personas to help them in this battle, right? Obviously, that's how this all goes down. Mm -hmm. So then they all wake up, and Lisa is like, yeah, that guy, that Philemon guy, he's linked to this thing called the Joker game, which is one of those silly games the kids play. Like, you know, like Bloody Mary, where you're like, oh, oh you're lights yeah, off in the bathroom, you say Bloody Mary, like, oh, she's going to show up and mm -hmm. I, I don't know, do bad stuff. 
Um, so naturally, kids, they're going to play the Joker game. She thinks that this guy's connected to the Joker game. Let's play it. Why not, right? Let's summon Joker. And not the cool Joker, like the protagonist of Persona 5. That's the cool Joker. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the clown man Joker. And not the Batman clown man Joker. Just a guy named Joker who's also dressed like a clown. Okay, not the twisted metal guy that's a clown either. This no, is the, not, not that guy. Not Needles Kane, okay. No. So he shows up, he fights them, shows off his persona. He says something about revenge, but then nobody really knows what he's talking about. He's like, I'm going to get revenge on all of you for this thing you did years ago. And everybody's like, I don't I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, dang, it's like kind of cringe. He sort of like walks away. He's like, you guys don't remember, but I'm going to get you back. <laughs> um, and all the kids are like, it's like Don Draper in, in uh, uh, Mad Men, where he's like, the kids are all like, I don't, I don't think about you at all. I don't know what this Ooh, is. Yeah, that's a good comeback. Yeah. Real good comeback. So he's a little embarrassed, but he vows revenge on them. So there is going to be revenge, though. Yeah, this is there is going to be revenge. Whenever they remember whatever sin they committed, perhaps an innocent sin. Mm. It's kind of a classic JRPG amnesia trope if Joker is to be believed. Anyway, he takes off. The team starts investigating rumors to get to the bottom of this because, dang, guys, that was real weird, right? Yeah, yeah we should yeah, probably yeah. figure this out. So a bunch of other weird stuff happens. I don't want to spoil it for everybody. I don't want to go into too much detail here. I haven't played through the whole game, although I did watch a very long story recap by a person on YouTube whose handle is just Courtney. That's her. <laughs> just Courtney. Somehow hey, she got the name Courtney. Thanks, Courtney. And she does all kinds of stuff. Uh, she has her most popular videos, I think, are her uh, persona recap videos. Um, anyway, she's done one for the first like three games, I think. Uh, so thanks, I watched Court. It. Yeah, thanks, Court. Court. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah a bunch of weird stuff happens there's a group called the masked circle they're harvesting the hopes and dreams of people and you know it's these children probably need to stop this world ending catastrophe right it makes the most sense why yeah. not employ children of course uh so there are a few characters who show up from previous megami tensei games including persona one which is why this game is considered a direct sequel although the story is it's connected but like it's not a direct continuation it's sort of just connected in the same world right um, I would say you don't really need to, in, to play the first persona to enjoy the story of this game, but you will come across characters that, that will stick out to you if you did play the first game. So like Maya Yamano, who's a journalist, she joins your party as a persona user. Um, we meet some more characters from the first game on the way, many of whom act as guides and mentors since they've done the whole persona thing before. Um, in sort of a proto social link kind of system, you can have relationships with different people in this game, including another man, which is pretty progressive for the time. I'd say it's pretty progressive um, and uh, no other persona game has had the option for like a same sex relationship since. And you know what really? I say to that? I say they're cowards. That's they what are saying. cowards. So it's anyway. 2024. That's right. Wake up. Yep. Maybe in persona six. Have they announced persona six? Have no, but anything about it. No, but we all know. These kind of games, I feel like they don't really like they they kind of like we're doing it and then it's going to be out soon. Like it's not going to be like. A yeah, thing, right? but yeah. we all know it's coming and it's probably been in development for six years already. It, it, they probably started development on that game like right before Persona 5 came out in true, 2017. True, true. So anyway, um, there's some like sort of social link stuff. Not really, though, in that game. Mm -hmm. There's some aliens. The storyline gets really unhinged. Oh, and, and like Hitler shows up. So let's talk about the development of this game. Excuse me. Uh, do you, oh, did you want to? Do you want to stop there? Do you want to go you back? Can't just you can't just casually drop Hitler shows up in a story for a game <laughs> and then move on to development. Tyler, I don't okay. think I'm the only one thinking this. I think people listening right now are also wonder, uh, curious about the next part. All right, let's. All right, so let's talk about Hitler. Then. <laughs> okay. Uh, so apparently. Like, remember the rumor system? Rumors become reality in this game, right? Okay, that's whole, okay, okay. That's yeah. the whole, like, mm -hmm. theme, the, the motif of this game. Um, rumors are so strong in this game that they have the power to resurrect one of the most vile men in history. <laughs> uh, so wow. Maya Amano's publishing company, this is the character from the first game that you will will play with in the, in the second game. Um, her publishing company leaked this, like, conspiracy book about how Hitler wasn't actually dead, right? And we've all heard these conspiracy stories of, like, oh, actually, he escaped and went to Argentina or whatever. Is like, Or he's, like, living in the center of the earth or whatever. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, dude's, theory. like, 150 now. So he's, yeah, yeah. If, even if that were true, he's definitely dead now. But mm. whatever. Um, anyway, in this world, rumors like that are enough to bring somebody back to life, I guess. You know, perception is reality and all that. So... 
Um, he's trying to do some demon stuff so he can take over the town, this like random, like small town in Japan. <laughs> this doesn't even exist. And, you know, presumably he's going to like try to take over the world. He's got an army of robot Nazis, so he can probably do this. This is a large part of this game. This is like a, a major plot point. Right? Like this like, is a pl- this is a thing you have to stop in the game. Yeah. This isn't like a throwaway like side story about like, haha, what if we stopped Hitler? Right. Like this is like part of the game. This is this is in the main. You know what this reminds me of? This kind of reminds me. Hit the tangent button. When this reminds me, thank you, of when we all watched the movie Red Dawn, and you're like, "Why are they invading this random small town in the middle of nowhere?" It's like, (laughs) wouldn't you go over like New York or Los Angeles or a coastal city? And you're like, "Nope, middle of nowhere. That's what we're going for. That's what this feels like to me." (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, so all of this stuff has been like willed into existence by these rumors, especially that book about the conspiracy about Hitler not being dead. So he's back. We brought him back, guys, I guess. <laughs> what a weird thing. So, oh, sorry, Mike. Did I call him Hitler? You did, did call I say him that? Hitler. You said okay. Hitler, yes. So in the PSP remake, he's not Hitler. They call him Fuhrer. They oh. take away the swastikas. They throw some sunglasses on Hitler <laughs> and they say it's not him. It's Fuhrer. This is not Hitler. He's got sunglasses, no swastikas. No one knows. No one is the, any the wiser here. I'm going to be honest. You're, you're selling it. This is the best you've sold a game to me so far. As how This sounds so ridiculous. I want to know more. I might need to watch Courtney's video is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, you got to watch Courtney's video. It's a it's very good uh, story recap of this. Um, and it, they have to do that because... Uh, and I just learned this very recently uh, while researching this episode, like why they made this change. Like on like the the easy thing is like, well, they didn't want to have actual Hitler in a video game. They decided they didn't want him. So they named him something different. They put sunglasses on him and they called it good. Right. Mm-hmm. That's fine. And like I would buy that if that were the answer. Um, but the Japanese rating game uh, rating system for for games is called Cero, uh, C-E-R-O. And mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't actually uh, I don't know if it, it depends. Maybe this changes the rating of a game if you do this, but. Um, it doesn't allow for real people in games. Oh, like so, historical figures? Yeah. So I don't know if that means that you just can't do it at all, or if that means, you know, it gets an automatic, you know, 17 plus rating or 18 plus rating. Like, I don't know exactly what the deal is there, but that's the like sort of the prevailing theory. If it's not just, hey, we shouldn't have Hitler in our video game. If that's like the reason, not the reason they did it, it's probably because of Sarah, like not allowing real people to be in a video game. So they're like, throw some sunglasses on him, take the swastikas out, call him Fuhrer. It's all good, right? I love that they threw sunglasses on him. <laughs> yeah, no one can tell. If you're wearing sunglasses, can't tell. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's that. It's weird. It feels kind of limiting to me to not allow real people in games. Like in this yeah. case, I'm like, hey, I'm not, I'm not like against it, but it seems strange to just not allow it at all, but that's especially maybe. because like you have games a lot of the time that are doing like alternative histories. Like that's entirely yeah. what Wolfenstein's built on. So it's like yeah. you, you, it would be like, how do they make that work? Or does it just not come out? I or don't know. Or maybe a... it just gets an automatic, like 18 plus rating and like, yeah, that's fine for games like, like that. But, rating. Yeah. But for games that are like, we're going for a teen rating here. We don't, we'll, we'll follow the rules. Like that seems like maybe what was going on here. Um, and it's that, and mature. it's that, super mature. Right. That uh, that rule or that ratings board, Saro, sort of came around later after this game came out. It was like 2003 or four or something. So it was like after the, the original game had come out. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So anyway, Hitler's in this game. Well, uh, the Fuhrer is. The He's Fuhrer is sunglasses. in this game. If you play the PSP remake, you're it's the Fuhrer. That's um, so bizarre <laughs> to me. Just such a weird... Because they're like, well, okay, so we have this thing where we can manifest. Who are we going to manifest? Well, you know who it's got to be. It's got to be Hitler. Like someone in a in a room was like, you know what we got to do? We got this is it. This is how, what is the logical extreme that this can go to? Well, we're bringing Hitler back, guys. They're like Napoleon? No. Mother Teresa? No. <laughs> it's got to be Hitler. That's <laughs> we're bringing back. Yeah. All right. So that's sort of like a general overview of the story. Again, if you really want like a, a plot point breakdown, you can watch the hour long video by Courtney on YouTube. It's great. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm, I like watching videos like that for games that I have played because it helps me understand them better. Uh, me too. I love that. I love a good lore video. Yeah. So, and she's great. She's very funny. Like it's just, I highly recommend her videos. Um, so let's talk about development, but for real this time, Mike, you're not um, going to tell me they dropped the king tut in this game or something weird 
Uh, maybe as a persona. I feel like King Tut has shown up in the series really? as a persona. I think okay. so. Okay. You're like, I wouldn't be surprised. Two, Robert E. Lee is showing up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Such Jeez. a weird thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the first game was considered a success in Japan. Um, and being a successful game, part of an already successful franchise, the Megami Tensei franchise, uh, meant that a sequel could kind of begin development right away, right? Like, hey, we put a game out, it did well, it's part of a series that does well, here you go, you got make the next one, right? All the people from the first game returned for the second, including the producer, Kouji Okada, the designer, Kazuma Kaneko, and the writer, Tadashi Satomi. Um, so they, they all sort of returned for this new game. Um, Sumeru City, which is the city where the game takes place, is a fictional city, but it is loosely based on a few different areas of Japan, like Shibuya, Yamate, and Odaiba, uh, according to Wikipedia. So I don't, I am hey, not knowledgeable know. enough of Japanese yeah. cities to know the accuracy of this, but seems legit to me. You gotta, you gotta do it. You know, you gotta go with it. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot of data out there about the development of this game being the late nineties. So like, that's not, I can't really go into it too much other than it seems like it went smoothly. Like, I feel like. In the 90s, games like this sort of had like, they were just kind of, they had a system. They were just kind of, they were able to just turn them out, churn them out, right? Um, so I, I wish I had more on the development here and I really don't, which is kind of a bummer because it just seems like they decided to make another one and they did and that's it. You know, and some some of these earlier games are like that though. They just don't, they don't record what happened. And yeah. we just kind of like, unless you get, find a lucky interview, you're not going to find one, which is just the way it is. So, yep, yep, that's the way it goes. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go back a little bit. Remember when I had you put yourselves in the shoes of that kid who just bought Where? Persona Two from yeah. Kmart? My Agro Let's go back Crag to that. shirt's on. Okay, your yeah. Agro Crag shirt is on. Mm -hmm. You've just opened up the instruction manual. You got a good whiff of that new game smell. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. I might go uh, sniff a manual right after this podcast. Yep. You start to read the story. It's all about how about reality and how darkness covered the land and how your character saw some bad stuff, made a deal with a god to forget those bad things, to make them become not reality anymore. So I'm going to read the last couple of paragraphs for you of the, the setup story here for this Persona game. So this is from the manual. This is it's just straight from the manual. I'm excited. Read to me. Read to me. I love this. At the time of the resurrection, reality was essentially re re sorry, reset. Forever locked away in, a, in another side as if it were the backside of a mirror. Tatsuya committed a grievous sin, which he refused to forget. That's the main character of Persona 2 Innocent Sin, Tatsuya. Okay. He committed a grievous sin, sin, which he refused to forget. His will was so strong that somehow his memory remained intact after the reset. When Tatsuya broke the deal, he caused a paradox in this new reality. So, from such an innocent sin as this, a world of eternal punishment came into existence. Tatsuya will learn that few things have changed and history has a horrible habit of repeating itself. Ooh, Whoa. that's very ominous. This stuff about innocent sin Ooh. seems pretty awesome, right? Sounds pretty important to the story. Does sound pretty cool. And that's why we talked about Persona 2 Innocent Sin today, Mike. But now consider this kid who flips closed the book to look at the cover of it again, it reads Persona 2 Eternal Punishment, not Innocent Sin. Did I get the first game? What game? Are they That's because Persona 2 Innocent Sin never came to America. Atlas, in their continued bungling of the localization of these games in the 90s, totally just skipped an entire game. They went straight to Eternal Punishment. So in the North America, you only yeah. can play Eternal Punishment. Yeah, if you so if you if you if you lived in North America, you played the first Persona game in the mid '90s, 1996, Revelations Persona. You played that game. You saw Persona Two on the shelf a few years later. You were like, "Heck yeah, dude! I'm on board. Love the first one. I want to play this new one." You're you're missing a game in between. There's a whole game missing. The whole game, and that's that's what like the when you're reading the instruction book for the for Eternal Punishment, like it's sort of giving you like the one page summary of innocent sin. That's and they just expect you to okay, just jump right in. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So there are some fan translations online that Atlas never like stopped, but this is the nineties or the early two thousands. Like you weren't going online and downloading PlayStation games and like applying patches to them to play them in maybe an emulator, I guess in 2000, I think some, some like janky PlayStation emulators existed. Maybe if you had a cool modded PlayStation, you would play, like you could patch it yourself, burn a CD and like play it on your PlayStation. But like nobody was doing that. Right. Yeah. Uh, but Atlas to their credit never stopped any uh like fan translations of that's good innocent sin they like just let it happen which is fine um so it wasn't until 2011 in the psp remake that north american players could play innocent sin that that's the only way to, to play that game today so if you, if you want to play this game game. you gotta get the psp remake yeah that's it so sources say that the team just couldn't spare the bandwidth to translate the original. They'd all moved on to Eternal Punishment as soon as Innocent Sin was gone, and they were just like, "We can't, we can't spare the cycles here to to translate the first one. We've all moved on, right?" Some say that all the Nazi iconography and literal Hitler that's in the first game sort of kept it kind of locked to Japan, because uh, that stuff probably. I mean, I'm not sure how well it, it flew in Japan, but it probably doesn't fly very well in the U.S. or North America, yeah. right? Well, um, we're already, it's, I mean, we're, we're kind of Nazis and Wolfenstein at this point. So. Yeah. Nowadays, I think it would be fine, but like maybe in those days, it was just, uh, it was just a different time, you know? Um, so yeah, I think there's probably truth to both of those things. Like it's probably a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, like, Hey, we don't have the resources. Also, we'd have to like make a bunch of changes because people in the, in North America aren't going to like this. Um, so yeah, they didn't. They didn't obfuscate the Hitler stuff until the PSP remake. The original in Japan had all that stuff just out in the open. It was just, it, they weren't even trying to hide it, right? Um, well, that well, that was still allowed there because the Saro stuff came about in the early 2000s. So yeah. Persona 2 Eternal Punishment is the direct, direct sequel to Persona 2 Innocent Sin. Uh, it's as direct of a sequel as we're going to get in the Persona series, uh, unless you want to count like Persona 5 Strikers, which is like a different game and a different genre, but it sort of like continues the story. Um, most people don't consider it canon, though, because it doesn't take into account the stuff that happened in Persona 5 Royal, which has a bunch of new story stuff. Strikers doesn't really deal with any of that. Um, so, you know, some people don't even think of that as canon. That's fine. Uh, you know, maybe we'll make that judgment when they, when we get there. But for now, we're going to leave it there because Persona 2 Eternal Punishment is its own game. And uh, we've gone on for a little a little while here, so I think I think we're good to sort of call it there. Does that sound I feel good? bamboozled. I feel like I've been bamboozled by 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 everybody. Today. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. You know, so. I just thought I was a kid at Kmart getting a game, and you built it up to me, and then all of a sudden I learned I missed out on sunglasses, Hitler, and things yeah. just never are the same for me. Yeah, you missed out on a whole game, a very interesting game. Um, but aliens. it is pretty cool. Aliens, Hitler. I want to. I want to watch the story recap. I, I'm into it. I'm excited yeah. about this now. Oh man, it's so good. It's where it's worth the watch. Uh, highly recommend Courtney's channel. Um, so yeah, that's it, Mike. What you been playing? Ooh, okay. So this week I have I beat Spider Man. Great. Big oh, news. nice. What'd you think? I loved it. The story was great. The story was like a perfect comic book story for me. Big fan. Loved it. Haven't touched the DLC yet. I kind of going to shelve it for now and go to some other stuff. So I also have been working on beating Advanced Wars Reboot Camp, playing the second game. Second game, so much longer than the first game. Like, I want to say the first game has like 20 missions. This one's got like 30 something in there. And oh, they're, wow. they're like a lot harder and more complex as they've added more stuff. in. there's like powers and superpowers. I never played the second one for Game Boy Advanced. I'm loving it. I'm having a great time. Um, and then also for the podcast, I tried my hand at Elder Scrolls Arena, the first Ooh. Elder Scrolls game to ever come out. And boy, oh boy, was that a painful experience. I want to talk about it. And I, I think it's kind of fun. It was painful in a funny way. Like I died a lot and I laughed every time I did because it was <laughs> so dumb how I died. So I really like love these games and I, I want to kind of go into talking about Bethesda and Elder Scrolls a bit. We've like, we've, we've talked about how we want to tackle these big games. Like do we go with the studio or do we go with the games? Mm -hmm. And for Bethesda, I think we might as well do just like Elder Scrolls and then maybe do a separate Bethesda thing. I know with Bungie, we talked about doing the whole thing, but yeah, we didn't know yet. So it was really interesting. What, what have you been playing this week though? 
Uh, all my gaming time has gone to Persona 3 Reload, which nice. is unsurprising considering the amount of Persona content I've consumed this week. You've got, you're all Persona all the time right now. I am. Yeah. I've got about a dozen hours in the game, a little more than a dozen hours in the game. Um, I'm kind of moving a little slow on it. I've also, I've just been working on a bunch of other like side projects. I got, I've gone real deep down the home automation rabbit hole. So what's been home on, automating? Oh man. I, so today I set up a thing that will track my cats as they wander around <laughs> our apartment. I love um, that. Mostly because when I close the door to my office at night, I want to know if there's a cat in there. And That's cats good. don't come when they're called, right? You can't just no. like, be like, hey, Toby, you got to come on. Uh, he's He doesn't care. He'll he's just, just too busy being a podcast producer. He's That's too right. focused on his job. We talked he's to very, Toby about this. Yeah, he's he needs to take a break. And... Most of the, sometimes he's like sitting on the couch and that's fine. I can just pick him up and carry him with me. But other times like they, they have some hiding spots. I have two cats. They have some hiding spots. Um, and I just want to be like, I just want to know, like if I, if, if, if they're in the office, I got to know about it. Right. So I don't shut the door on them if they are. Um, so anyway, that's. So now that, you have cat radar in your house. I have cat radar in my house and I have, I have two base stations set up right now that will track them in the office or the living room. I'm going to set up a few more because I want to get a little bit more accurate on it. Um, but that's that's the biggest thing that I've been working on right now. Um, there's a lot of other like little things that I've been doing too, but I'm just, I'm like real deep in that rabbit hole of building like custom little sensors and stuff. I'm having a lot of fun with it. So if, you, if you're if you into home automation and you're on Discord, let's let's talk I mean, about this it. This is Tyler's Tech Tips channel for just this, you know, or Tyler's Tech Talk. Tech yeah, talk. I think Tyler's Tech Talk. Yeah, we can go it. in there. Tell me about your home automation stuff. I'm using Home Assistant. Uh, an open source like home automation platform. So if you're into that, you want to talk about it, hit me up because I do want to talk about it. Well, I love it, Tyler. So great. Well, the episode came out late this week because I was out of town and things were getting kind of weird, but we got it out. So that's what's important. So with that, uh, you can always find us on codexpodcast.net. You can send us an email at codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. And other than that, Tyler, do you want to say bye to everybody for the day? Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. 